On the line, we have Sue Bolton, um, who is a Moreland City Councillor um, and member of Social Alliance. And we're having on the line, I guess, to talk a bit about some of the social aspects of um, the COVID-19 crisis. Good Welcome, morning, Sue. Sue. Hi, how's it going? Yeah. Um, Sue, I'd like to, um, I guess, maybe... Um, we've um, on our show already. We've sort of covered a bit of the political kind of aspects, and I guess you know you as Moreland Council has probably a bit more aware of some of the social kind of aspects and the social consequences of COVID nineteen. And I guess maybe to start it off a bit of discussion, I guess I want to kind of hear a bit of a kind of your perspective on these kind of um, around some of the commentary around panic buying, um, and I guess what what the kind of COVID kind of 19 kind of reflects um, about that. I mean, just as I was going into the show, I saw at least uh, groups of um, elderly people lining up at Woolworths and Coles before they were open. And yeah, I just want to hear, I guess, a bit your thoughts on that. Well, I think the panic buying is a result of not just individuals, it's a result of the government. Because the government has basically indicated to people that you may have to go into isolation for two weeks or quarantine for two weeks or more, um, and therefore you need to stock up. So, But it provided no means of guaranteeing that there would be any fair and equitable distribution of goods. So, of course, people went and stocked up, which is essentially panic buying. <laughs> Um, and, and because there was no collective means of distributing goods in a fair way, of course people living in a capitalist system where there's no guarantee that anyone's going to look after you, um, people did react and have reacted in an individualistic way because that's what capitalism does. It, it forces you to look after yourself. Um, because there's no guarantee of someone else looking after you. And I think in the case of the bushfires, there it was sort of a different kind of crisis and um, there are, were already um, some sorts of volunteer organisations set up or able to be set up quite quickly in um, bushfire-affected towns, but also, um, you know, especially through the... Um, CFA, but also even groups set up to um, send aid to bushfire-affected regions. And that's not quite the situation in um, Australia with um, distribution of food and essential services. And even some of the pictures of people with, you know, lots of dunny rolls in their um, trolleys. I mean, the thing is, you don't really know, is that person got a big family or are they just someone who's sort of hoarding? Um, I suspect that there's only a very tiny, tiny percentage of people who are greedy and, and buying up stock to sell at high prices on eBay, etc., and Gumtree, etc. I think, um, you know, what we see is people being forced to look after themselves and their family because the government hasn't properly distributed things. And the supermarkets are not a good means of distribute, distributing things because these are essentially private businesses. So they've got no obligation to um, maybe save up some stock to distribute to people who, um, you know, who are on low income. Um, and, you know, my uh, the reports I've heard of, you know, keeping an hour free at the very early um, hours of the morning for elderly people and, and people with disabilities is that they're still arriving and the shelves are there um, because the supermarkets haven't been able to um, keep up um, because they are set up on a just-in-time um, stock arrangement rather than um, having um, reserves of stock. Um I mean, re in reality, I suspect really to have a fair and equitable um, arrangement in terms of distributing food and and supplies, um, the government probably needs some form of fair rationing system to guarantee that especially people who are vulnerable or on not just people who are on healthcare cards, people who are in minimum wage, 
um, casual workers, etc., can access the things that they that they need. So this is entirely a product of capitalism and capitalist governments that just leave people to fend for themselves. Mm. Absolutely. Um, now, Sue, so you're uh, as a council, you're sort of on the coal face of what's happening in the community. Um, can you tell us a little bit about one of the things that I am finding on social media and just talking to work colleagues and friends and family is that we have a situation where a lot of people are feeling quite anxious, quite scared. Perhaps some of this, you know, uh, panic buying behaviour is a result of that as well. But there is a lot of people who are vulnerable in the community, um, and especially, you know, vulnerable with regards to mental health. Is there anything that the government or councils or we as a society should or could be or are doing um, in order to uh, sort of boost morale and make sure that the mentally, um, you know, the people who don't have the greatest mental health at the moment and are being challenged and isolated, um, and what can we do to, to help them basically? Well, firstly, I think the government needs to guarantee that the anyone who's residing in Australia at the moment will have access to our welfare system. Yes. Um, there are all sorts of people in the community who um, who are going to suffer incredibly because they have no access to our welfare system. Um, so... You know, some of those groups of people include who don't have full rights as citizens um, include uh, international students who are losing their jobs but at the same time being demanded by the universities to pay their fees. They can't go back home because every country around the world has got sort of travel bans of some, some kind, so they can't go home. So they have to stay here. And they've been paying taxes <laughs> to Australia, um, but they're losing their jobs. But they have no, because a lot of them work in hospitality or the areas that are um, going to suffer the hardest under this um, COVID-19, and they've got no access to welfare. Um, they're also New Zealanders who arrived in Australia since the laws were changed, um, I uh, can't remember when that was, maybe the 80s or early 90s, where they have no access to welfare rights. They've got uh, they've got on a special visa arrangement so that they can um, live and work in Australia, but they don't have access to welfare. Their kids don't have access to HECS, and they're not able to become permanent residents. Then you've got people on, um, you know, various um, temporary work visas, who also, um, you know, usually if they lose their jobs, they face deportation. And then you've got tourists um, and, you know, and asylum seekers who don't have full rights. So basically the protections of Medicare and welfare should be extended to every single person who's in Australia at the moment. And every country around the world should be doing that as well. We should not be paying international forcing international students or people who don't have access to our system to pay for hospital care pay upfront fees for hospital care and medical care um, so I think we've got to shift society away from a profit driven society to a care for our fellow humanity kind of society um, I'm especially worried about uh, people who are homeless during this period and people who could be yes. made homeless by ruthless landlords. And also the um, reports coming out of Wuhan in China are that um, domestic violence or violence against women uh, tripled uh, during the lockdown because women were forced to spend a lot of time with their abusers. They were locked in a small mm -hmm. space with their abusers. And I'm very worried about that aspect, um, in particular because we don't have enough housing. And I actually think this is the time when the government should requisition vacant dwellings and be going full steam to build new permanent dwellings, public housing dwellings, and as well as temporary, um, temporary accommodation for people who are homeless or need to flee um, abusive situations. Hmm. 
Yeah, on the question around um, rent protection and um, um, housing, um, interestingly enough, um, the UK um, has just announced sort of um, mortgage freezes or some kind of mortgage freeze, um, you know, um, system um, for three months. But I guess the main issue with this essentially is um, just reading between the lines is essentially it gives equal weight to, to both landlords and um, and renters. And so in some sense that basically they could put um, they could put um, evictions on hold for three months, but then the the landlord might ha- be put in a position where once the crisis is over. Um, renters will be stuck with lots of debt of all this kind of unpaid rent. Um, so I think, you know, it doesn't necessarily seem to be a, a step forward in that sense. And I guess what would your ideas be on, you know, protecting the rights of tenants in this sort of um, um, period? Well, I think there should be, um, they should introduce a law against evictions uh, to prevent evictions altogether. Um, I also think think that you possibly need to differentiate between different types of landlords. Um, This is um, just thinking off the top of my head because I think there are, um, you know, there's, you know, the landlords who own lots of properties, absentee landlords raking in the cash from all of their properties, etc. But there are some landlords who are workers, you know, who've worked there all their lives, maybe they have bought an investment property and maybe they've lost their jobs or, um, you know, have got some illness which, or, or, you know, cancer or whatever that prevents them from working. So I sort of, um, I have a feeling you do need to sort of have some sort of means for sort of differentiating. Um but I, on the other hand, I do think um, people need to be protected. Um, and I think there should be no evictions in this period. That should be a guarantee of no people being evicted in this period. Um, no bank for, foreclosures on, um, on uh, people who can't afford to pay their mortgage. No evictions for people who can't afford to pay their rent. Um, and... I think um, especially landlords who, um, you know, especially landlords who have multiple properties um, and landlords who've got other means of income and the rent is just, you know, you know pocket money and <laughs> for spending money on top of their other incomes should be... Um, should be forced to just relinquish, uh, you know, um, forego any rent in this um, in this period um, for several months uh, until um, we're on top, you know, we've passed this virus. Because people, the handouts are primarily going to business. They're not going to um, workers and people who are unemployed and, and pensioners. You know, sure, tiny, few little scraps are going... Um, towards people who are on pensions and benefits. But the most important thing the government is not doing is increasing New Start back to the po- up to the poverty line. Um, that would be a start. And New Start is something like 150 or $180 below the poverty line. It is so low. Um, but the government does not want to create a precedent of increasing this payment permanently ongoing. So that's why they're just doing a one-off $750 payment. They do not want to increase this permanently and it needs to be increased permanently. And I think we've got to try and win back, use this period of this crisis which shows up how rotten this capitalist system is to win back our rights, to win back permanency of secure work not um, not this casualised hand-to-mouth existence that so many workers have, um, win back our rights to an adequate welfare system so that when we're forced out of work, we've got a system to rely on, which we've paid our taxes for. Um, we need to win back our rights to um, permanent secure housing. And I think we need to really push this 
And so while we've been pushed to campaigning in an online world, we can't give up actually campaigning. And we've got people like Alan Joyce who earns, you know, something millions of dollars every year. Why isn't he giving that money to the Qantas workers? Hmm. Yeah, absolutely. Um, um, yeah. Oh, you want to wrap it up? Well, yeah. Um, so, so is there anything that you... We're going to be wrapping up uh, the interview now, but is there anything that we haven't gone over or anything, anything sort of that you want to uh, um, emphasise? Well, I think those are probably the key things, and I'm especially concerned about people who are homeless in this situation because home, a lot of homeless people... Um, uh, you know, whether people are moving from couch to couch in friends and families, um, houses and flats, or whether people are living rough on the streets, in their cars, wherever, um, or people who are in um, insecure housing and so forth, I think uh, are the m- most at risk in this situation. So really wealthy people in a position to look after themselves um, I, I think um, you know they will have, they will get special deliveries from uh, food suppliers and all the rest of it. They will not be suffering. It is ordinary people who are suffering, and people who are poor can't afford to stock up um, because you get so little, such little income to um, last you. Well, it doesn't even last you the fortnight. So homeless people are the most vulnerable people who are in insecure housing most vulnerable and we've got to use this period to really fight for a massive expansion in public housing which they could do right now during the crisis all right thank you very much sue <laughs>